And uh, what I'll do is uh, probably spend uh, 15 minutes or so uh, kind of going real quickly through uh, this material that, uh, again, was uh, I, I, I've, I've heard a lot of comments and seen and gotten a number of questions uh, about this subject. So I'll kind of go through here to give you a little taste of this. I'd refer to uh, Dave Steinberg's book. That's where a lot of the stuff in this, uh, in this chapter here comes from. Overcoming problems in printed circuit board design. I'm going to break these problems into two categories. First exceedance. First exceedance problems are problems associated with stress. One stress cycle, you have damage. That's first exceedance problem. Then we'll break it into fatigue. Fatigue is time dependent failures. So for non-time dependent failures, some of the things that you should be looking at to solve those problems, uh, redesign is reasonably unattractive but redesign for greater strength to absorb that stress or isolate your component from the stress. Isolate the system in general, add damping. This is something the marketing folks will hate. Derate the system operation performance. Nobody's gonna like that. You walk in there and say, look, it just won't work. Uh, fatigue problems, we talked at length about stress concentrations. Increased fracture toughness and provide for proper preload and locking of fasteners. That's if your fasteners keep coming loose. Uh, preload. Uh, preload's a good one. Um, so well, let's say you're, you're, you're putting something together, and this is for printed circuit boards, which is a little more dicey because uh, when you're thinking in the vibration test lab, when you preload your bolts, you have socket head cap screws and a big torque wrench. Well, this is printed circuit board design. Chances are these are Phillips head screws or just slotted screws. So trying to maintain a preload on a Phillips head screw is tough. So that's why they use things like lock washers, lock tight, to make sure that the fastener is locked in place. <coughs> Operational problems. So these are problems that would come about while the board is shaking around that it doesn't work while it's shaking, but you stop the, uh, stop the, the, the excitation and it starts working again. Things you can do, add stiffeners. So if you add stiffeners to the board uh, and a stiffener, so let's say that we've got a board that kind of looks like this. <coughs> and it wants to diaphragm like that, bulge up and back and forth like that. Uh, you can look at that mode shape and go, ooh, that, that diaphragming frequency is low. I need to increase that. You can increase it knowing the mode shape, whereas you can put a stiffener across here and maybe one across there like that. It could just be a strap or something like that, and that'll stiffen that panel to diaphragming. So that would be adding stiffeners. You can isolate critical parts. Again, add damping. Change the mode shape by adding supports, kind of like that. It's not going to diaphragm. If you put a stiffener in there, it'll diaphragm this little cup here. Uh, pick more rugged parts. The bad news about that is they're probably more expensive. Provide for adequate locking of fasteners and adjustments. Uh, reduce relative motion. Make sure things don't come close to touching. Encapsulation, we talked about that on Monday. General design guidelines for structures. We saw this already. Efficient structures are tension and compression members. Torsion is next least efficient and bending is the least efficient way. Limiting flange lengths to 15 times the thickness. So um, if you, let's say that you had a structure that kind of looked like this. And that's generally referred, uh, uh, most of the time in electronics, things like this would be a chassis. But if you've got a structure that kind of looks like that, this little rule right there means this length right there should be no more than 15 times the thickness. That'll keep them from flopping around. Use closed torque boxes whenever possible. Uh, I talked about that with regard to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. 
a closed cross section is upwards of 50 times stiffer than an open cross section. What I've shown right there is an open cross section. That is a closed cross section. Uh, an externally loaded structure should use a high stiffness material. So something that is designed to support a load should use a high stiffness material. But a, a structure that is loaded by its own weight, in other words, its own inertia, you can use pretty much any common structural material. Uh, weld or bond for maximum thick, uh, stiffness. I talked about that. Don't bolt. Um, bolts should be preloaded. Uh, use rivets, shoulder bolts, or expanding sleeves for shear connections. Whoops. <laughs> Is that outside? Yeah, yeah. Oh, somebody's motorcycle? So we have two plates here that are being pulled and they're being sheared with respect to each other. If you just bolt them together, if you just bolt them together, and I'm, oh, there's a nut on the back right here. There is a clearance hole that the bolt has to go through. So that means there's a gap between the, uh, the bolt and that hole. And the only thing that is holding those two plates together is friction. That's it. If that friction is insufficient, they will slide and they'll slide until they hit the bolt. And then you'll load them the other way and they'll slide and hit the bolt again. So they'll go bang, 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 like this. So a good shear connection does not rely on just friction. A good shear connection fills this entire hole. How do you do that? Well, a rivet does that. You put a rivet in there and it expands to fill the hole. Shoulder bolts have a line-to-line -line fit and expanding sleeves, uh, like a, a, a split pin. You've probably seen those things before. And uh, use fastener locks. Make sure that the uh, bolts don't come loose. This is something that I don't have uh, a lot of first-hand knowledge of is part selection for electronics. Um, there are just some general guidelines about <coughs> different types of connectors, resistors, capacitors, um, and generally printed circuit boards are made out of fiberglass. Um, but one of the problems with fiberglass boards is that the carriers that hold integrated circuits are made out of ceramic because they need to be insulating. Uh, there's a difference in thermal expansion between ceramic and fiberglass. So if you have large temperature swings, that can actually cause the ceramic to crack. Uh, some uh, <coughs> rules of thumb about damping. If you want to add damping to a printed circuit board, a conformal coating can reduce the Q by a factor of two. Extensional dampers that stick off that can reduce the Q by a factor of three. Constrained layer damping can reduce the Q by a factor of five. Uh, snubbers uh, aren't exactly dampers. S snubbers are little rubber standoffs or something like that that keep boards from deforming too far. Uh, shot dampers are pretty much jars filled with lead shot. Uh, uh, damping is most effective for reasonably low frequencies. Uh, generally, the lowest mode of vibration is the most critical. We went over that already. Here are some uh, again, rules of thumb about the e effectiveness of fasteners for bending load transfers for thin walled chassis. Uh, this is the fastener right there. If it's a quarter turn fastener, we assume that they are only 10% effective. That's because you can't put a proper preload on a quarter turn fastener. Screws placed at a pitch of 10 diameters are only 25% efficient, and screws and rivets placed at a four diameter pitch are 50% efficient. Where does this number come from? Well, it's the actual load on this connection the area is only that big, the area is only that big, and the area is only that big. There is this section right here that is basically not carrying any load, so it's not very efficient. Uh, how things are made. Uh, let's see. More, more important here. 
Uh, a lot of most electronic enclosures have a tendency to be bent sheet metal. It does damp well. It's just not very robust and has reasonably low natural frequencies. Diaframming of uh, electronic enclosures is a big problem. Uh, an example, I think I gave some of these numbers out earlier. Typical cues, a solid machine structure would have a cue of about 50, a welded structure about 25, a riveted assembly about 12, and a bolted assembly about 10. Now there's a rule of thumb here for uh, electronic equipment that allows you to estimate what the uh, magnification factor at resonance would be just knowing what the natural frequency of your, uh, your component is. If you know what the natural frequency is, you can go down to this table, find your natural frequency. Let's say it's 250 hertz. That means the A equals 1.0. 1.0 times the square root of natural frequency. That'll give you the approximate Q. Uh, these are some guidelines for how to support various things that live on a printed circuit board. So it's a plot of weight this way versus how you hold things down. So all it's really saying is that in this region right here, where your components are very light, if your component has axial leads, you don't need any support. If the leads come out the same side and the body dimension is less than 200 thousandths on a side, again, you don't need any support. <coughs> but if the component has ribbon leads, anything over uh, 100 milligrams has to be bolted down. Ribbon leads don't provide much support. Then once you get out here, if your parts are cylindrical, conformal coating is sufficient to hold them down. If your parts are flat, conformal coating out to about 8 grams is sufficient to hold them down. Once you get above about 8 grams, you have to glue them down. And once you get above about 25 grams, you actually need to clamp them in some way. And here are pictures of uh, the various techniques for holding components down as a function of size. Now, as you flex the board, not only are you loading, straining, and fatiguing the board, but you're fatiguing everything that is attached to it including these guys which look suspiciously like resistors. And what you end up doing is causing fatigue cracks in the leads. You could cause cracks in the solder joint as well. So there's a number of different failure modes. They're all addressed in various ways by this. So let's say that we have a board that has a large component on it. Uh, again, from Steinberg, there's an empirical formula that has been derived right here. It says you must limit the center deflection of the board to 0.00022 times the length divided by C that I'll come back to. The thickness, um, R is the rough position of that big heavy thing, and L is the size of the heavy thing. So what are the other values I said uh, C will come back to. The C is just a dimensionless constant that accounts for the different types of electronic components that could be sitting on the board. Again, R is a measure of where the big heavy thing is. Is it right in the center? Is it at one of the corners? Uh, general guidelines for where to put things. Uh, mount long dual inline packages parallel to the long dimension of the board. Mount heavier com components near the edge. Uh, bond the connector body to the board. I showed you the, uh, my MP3 player. That's a good example of that. Uh, high G loads, consider stiffening ribs and gluing them down. You can bond the ribs to the board. Uh, when you're modeling it, assume that a printed circuit board is a uniformly loaded plate simply supported on four sides or two sides, depending on how you grab them. Simple supports. A simple support just means that it allows rotation through the support. It's very difficult to get a fixed support on a printed circuit board. Unless you use wedge clamp edge guides, most of the time they are a simple support for modeling purposes. Uh, we talked about that already. Quick question on yeah. that one. Um, would uh, bolting it down on the four corners 
still be considered a simple story? <coughs> no. Uh, yes. I thought you were going to say fixed. No. Well, okay. bolted in the corners is a simple support okay. as well. Um, the uh, so there's a plate. If you load it so that it diaphragms, this is if the ends are fixed. So you can see it bulges the way that it's supposed to, but look at the ends. The ends are still straight up and down, like that. That is a fixed support. This is a simple support. So you can see when this thing diaphragms, it takes the edge with it. And what I propose is if you've got a bolt sitting here, the bolt is just going to bend. So the, a bolt does not provide a fixed support. It'll rotate and it'll allow rotate of the component through the bolted connection. <clears throat> so we can do an example, and this example uh, goes by really quick because the, uh, the problem is that in the class that I use this, uh, use this in, we've already done all the analysis already before, by the time we get here. But we've got a printed circuit board like this. Um, it, uh, it sees an input acceleration of 4 Gs at resonance. Here are some of the properties that we have calculated so far. It turns out the resonant frequency of that thing is 53 hertz, and that is diaphragming like that. If we know what the natural frequency is, we can calculate what the Q is. So we know the Q is about 8.7. If we know the Q, we can figure out the loading of the board. And the loading of the board is this equation right here. It's the force per square inch. This is the dynamic force. The entire board weighs one pound. You multiply it by the Q, which is 8.7, and the input G level, which is four. So that gets us the loading per square inch of area. Uh, there's an equation here, again, from Steinberg, which, is, uh, which uses the moment per inch of width to calculate the stress and the deflection in a plate. Uh, let's suffice it to say, based on that loading right there, we find that the moment per inch of width is about one pound inch per inch. Uh, this again is an equation that relates that <clears throat> moment per inch of width, thickness, and the maximum stress. Again, this is a diaphragming plate. Also buried in here is K sub T, which is a stress concentration factor. Aren't most boards riddled with holes? A hole in a board, we should include a stress concentration factor. We include a stress concentration factor of 3.0. You do this and you calculate that the maximum stress in the board at 4 Gs at resonance is about 5,000 PSI. Well, generally, an endurance limit for fiberglass is around 10,000 PSI. So if our actual stress is about half of the endurance limit, fatigue is absolutely no problem. The problem is we need to go through and figure out what the actual deflection of this board is. So uh, here's a closed form solution for deflection of the center of a diaphragming plate. Uh, do the math, we have, all, we have everything that we need. It turns out that the center of the board deflects 180 thousandths. Well, we already had an equation that said for, to prevent, because the analysis we did was just based on the structure of the fiberglass. But don't we need to address everybody that lives on that printed circuit board? We haven't done that yet. So there is a displacement limit to prevent fatigue of the devices living on the board. And it was this. We're going to assume that a, the big heavy thing is, uh, is one inch in size, and it's located dead center and parallel to the long axis of the board. So that gives us a C equal to 1, an R equal to 1. Thickness is a 16th, and the length of the long side is 8 inches. Plug in what we know. The allowable displacement is 28 thousandths. That's a lot less than 180 thousandths. So it's deflecting too far. The board, the board won't fail, but most of the components on it will, will be fatigued to death. So it is, as imprinted in, in red, unacceptable. So what would we do? Well, you could do two things. You could put stiffeners in, so some stiffening ribs to stiffen the board. If you stiffen the board, that should limit the displacement. 
It'll also change the natural frequency as well, so it, it, uh, it would require more analysis. A stopgap solution is to put snubbers in. What a snubber would be is you would put a snubber in that has a height equal to 180 minus 28. And what that will do is when the board deflects 28 thousandths, it hits something, so it can't, can't deflect any further. Uh, snubbers, yes, do limit dynamic deflection. You have to be careful with them, though, because when they bottom out and hit the snubber, they actually generate an impact load. Bang, 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 every cycle, which could be more damaging than the deflection itself. And that's why they're generally made out of something soft. <coughs>